in the night Your heart fills with dread Probably a murderer who wants you dead It could be a ghost, a demon or worse Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse It's hopeless, you're doomed You'd call a priest if you could You'd rather just listen to who? Sinisterhood I'm gonna kill you Welcome to Freaky Friday Where we tell your odd but true stories Welcome uh, oh, <laughs> I'm here with the story Somalia Yet again Greetings another and week. salutations <laughs> We have another flight of uh, Like a wine flight where they How bring interesting you... you say flight Because these first two involve airplanes. Look at that. One of my friends that's a pilot messaged me and was like, if you want stories that will truly chill you to the bone, read about airplane incidents. And we have those today that people have witnessed, been a part of. What were the incidents this pilot was referring to? Mm, uh, incidents where pilots on the black box mm. for, are recorded making comments that they're ready to take the plane down, that it's their last flight <gasps> and it's everybody's last flight. No! That yeah. happens? It has happened, apparently. Holy shit. They sent me links and uh, it was right before we were going to Montreal and I thought, I don't want to read this right now. God! I was like, I'll read it later. <laughs> My friend said, this will haunt you. And I said, it did. Yeah. Just the headline. <laughs> I haven't even read it and I'm haunted. Yeah, the whole concept. That's well, my aviation law class in law school, like a good maybe seventy five percent of it was reading about incidents and disasters that would then cause litigation, and then how the litigation came out. We had some stuff on regulatory, but it was majority focused on. It should have been called aviation litigation because it was on if you're if a plane crashes, whose fault is it? Who can you sue? Who can the family sue? Things like that. Golly, yeah, it was quite a class. He made us carry around binders. Just make a book, man. <laughs> binders with printed out in information? Yeah, the cases were printed out in binders. So then if any if I drop the binder, any pages fall out, I look deranged that I was, was like, it, I was were, just... did you not three hole punch them? They were, but things you flip them around, yeah. things start to get loose they in there. Tear. It's not like they were in page protectors. No. So if you lose a sheet, you're hosed, your <laughs> reputation. They're like, that girl's just over in the corner reading about a disaster. You or you miss uh, a really important part of the case because that that's page right. got lost you're like i guess it ended up fine that's that's just where it ended he's like no there was no, an ending. quite the opposite well that's terrifying and i often think while on planes man we're all putting our faith in what in a person we've never met before that has uh all literally all of our lives in their hand right now that's true we hope you know there's uh there's two of them up there so there's that well that's you know. what i was just wondering on these ones when that happens does a struggle ensue where the co-pilot's trying to, like, prevent it? I imagine so. Maybe they go to the bathroom, they lock them out. God. I don't know. Man, that's... Happy Friday. Sorry, <laughs> we're talking about this horrifying thing. If I have to think about it, so do you. Yeah. Well, there we go. Happy Friday. It's really Thursday, but to you guys, it's Friday. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of airplanes and fucked up shit, let's get started. There you go. I'm Christy. I'm Heather. And let's get freaky. This first one is from Sam, and the subject line is attempted murder via airplane. Hi, ladies. You are both amazing, and your podcast is one of my favorites. I love your new Freaky Friday episodes and have a few stories to eventually share with y'all. This story took place in 2018 and really shook my small hometown of Payson, Utah, and my sister and brother-in-law were the first ones on the scene. Here you go. Payson is a medium-small town of around 20,000 residents, so it's a pretty big deal to the entire town when anything out of the ordinary takes place. This crime was so strange, it was actually a pretty big story all over the Utah news after it happened. But my personal connection to this story is that my sister and brother-in-law are next-door neighbors to the family and were the first people on the scene after the incident. This crime was actually an attempted murder-suicide. The three intended victims got away, but the aggressor died. The people involved were a father-slash-stepfather, his wife, a teenage son, and a preteen daughter. The father, named Dwayne Yude, was arrested one day prior to the murder attempt for domestic violence against the mother. 
He posted bail around midnight, then called a friend. Yude was a trained pilot and asked his friend slash employer if he could borrow his small twin-engine airplane to go on a flight to blow off steam. His friend allowed him to borrow the plane. He took off from the Spanish Fork airfield and immediately flew south to Payson, about 10 miles away. Around 2.30 a.m., my brother-in-law was awoken by the sound of a loud engine. The sound kept getting louder, then quiet, then loud again, then quiet. This continued for a few minutes, and my brother-in-law went outside to see what was causing this sound. Yude was flying the airplane in circles over the neighborhood, coming down very close to the houses, then flying away again. Before my brother-in-law could figure out what was going on, the plane crashed directly into the front of the Yude family's home. The plane first hit the top of an SUV parked out front, then right into the family home. The home caught on fire immediately. My brother-in-law called 911, and first responders arrived quickly. He went to the back of the house and started yelling to see if there were any responses from inside. The wife and daughter were in a back bedroom and were able to crawl out of a window, practically unharmed, before the fire spread to the rest of the house. The son happened to be staying the night at a friend's house. It seems miraculous that they were unharmed looking at the wreckage, but it was discovered that since the airplane had hit the SUV first, it lost some of its momentum and did not make it all the way through to the back bedrooms. The entire family, aside from the father who died on impact, survived. Here are a couple of pictures of the wreckage. Thanks for letting me write in and for being so entertaining. You guys rock, and I hope your podcast never ends. Sam. Well, I am currently looking at a USA Today article that has a video footage, helicopter footage of the wreckage and exactly what Sam said. Miraculous that nobody was injured mm-hmm. except, I mean, obviously the pilot, but that no, the sister and brother-in-law, of course, the family inside. It's It does look like the SUV kind of toppled over and the plane is annihilated. There's a, It looks like maybe the right, it's upside down. The right wing is intact. Will you share your screen with me? Oh, yeah, sure. And the tail is intact. Let me see. What's so upsetting about this, I mean, besides the obvious, is the night before Mm -hmm. he was arrested for domestic violence charges and gets out. And like we've seen with so many cases like that, it's they pick up where they left off, except worse. Now he's like even more pissed. And oh, my God. And and, that's um, fucking crazy. You have this idea of, well, I'm out on bail, so I have to, you know, now now's the time. Yeah, I vague, I think I remember this happening. I vaguely, re- God bless America. Yeah, that plane is much bigger than I imagined, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for a twin engines can be pretty large. I mean, you think, you know, a small private plane we see flying over, people doing pl- flight lessons, you know, the little Cessna or whatever, but... This is, I mean, the the wing, one wing runs the length of their garage, their mm-hmm. two-car garage. Mm-hmm. So that gives you an idea of kind of how big that plane would be overall. And the the body, what's left of the plane body, extends all the way their front step almost to the street. Yeah, they they have one of those houses where the garage is on the front. Mm-hmm. So the plane extends from the end of the house to the other end of the house. The So it's... Like where the front door is to the end of the garage. Yeah. The plane extends. That's wild. That's horrifying that that, uh, he had that whole time flying over there to think about what he was going to do. And he still did it. Yeah. Still man- like planned it. That's a citation too. That's not a twin engine. It says it's a Cessna 525. Those look like jet engines to yeah, me. Yeah, it's why big. I to it's it. much bigger than I thought. Yeah, that's that's significant. God, so, and I'm sure the guy that let him borrow the car, I mean, or the plane, he probably yeah. or the yeah, the plane, sorry. He maybe he didn't even know what had happened the night before. But if yeah. you say I want to blow off some steam, I don't know. I mean, you could say that about anything, I guess. I'm it's very miraculous like Sam said that no one except for the pilot was and the uh abuser was injured in that Whew. yeah i think i mean i'm sure if you've flown it before and if you have the credentials and you say hey let me take it around you know i just want to mm-hmm. buzz around a little bit 
that unless you knew for a fact that that happened, you'd just be like, yeah, sure. Yeah, it's around 40 to 50 feet long, and the wingspan's 40, about 50 feet, Yeah, depending on the model of the Cessna 525. Yeah, it's a Citation Jet M2. That's uh, definitely uh, a lucky thing that the son was at another house, and the mom and daughter happened to be in the back of the house, and that uh, Sam, your brother-in-law and sister, were that the plane landed where it did, right? which was on a pretty you know they're unoccupied area nobody's in the car and right in the yard for a plane that big it's very surprising that more than one house was not taken out exactly that's uh that's horrifying well thank you sam and another horrifying plane story comes in from florida man and the subject line is i took a flight lesson with the lolita express pilot first of all i'm from florida Pauses for jokes. Many years ago, I was working for a company that offered flying lessons with a company plane and a professional pilot. I've never been afraid to fly, so I signed up for my first complimentary flight lesson. A few weeks later, I'm pulling up to the airplane hangar and out walks this beautiful, tall blonde. She was stunning. I stuttered through a, hello, how are you? My instructor introduced herself as Nadia. And after some pre-flight checks, we climbed into the cockpit and we were up in the air. Between instructing me on how to read all the dials, lights, and keep the plane level, we made small talk. Nadia told me about her flying career. She had set some records and was known as the Gulfstream girl in the aviation community. She took some pictures of me flying, and after an hour or so, we landed the plane. Mostly her, as I had a death grip on the stick. I thanked her for the lesson and decided that flying just wasn't for me and never scheduled another lesson. I went about the rest of my life until COVID lockdown 2020, when I'm watching a series called Dirty Money about Jeffrey Epstein. Nadia's picture pops up on the screen and my eyes pop out of my head. Remember in the beginning of the email I said I was from Florida? Hold on to your butts. I was a student at Royal Palm Beach High School when Jeffrey Epstein was trafficking underage girls to not only his home on Palm Beach Island, but also his private island in the Caribbean. Nadia Marcinko was his Lolita Express pilot and a co-conspirator. I didn't know about Jeffrey Epstein's crimes until years after I graduated. As an adult, I can't help but think that some of my classmates also met Nadia, but under much different circumstances, and it makes me sick. That's how I didn't end up on the Lolita Express in high school, but did end up taking a flight lesson with a Jeffrey Epstein co-conspirator as an adult. Wow. You, when you're watching that, the documentary and somebody that, you know, a documentary about heinous crimes Mm. in your area and somebody's face that, you know, pops up. I mean, that's like a record scratch moment. And you also think, well, shit. I was a step away from perhaps being propositioned. Maybe I was too old. I, it, you know, if this was, um, if they were no longer in high school at the time, then mm-hmm. probably um, wasn't what Jeffrey Epstein was looking for. But like they said, their classmates perhaps didn't have the same luck and, and instead became victims. And fuck Nadia to the moon and beyond. I don't know Mm -hmm. where she is right now, hopefully in jail, but anybody that took part in the crimes that he committed needs to be in prison forever. It's just... Certainly, and yeah. Any aiding, especially you're now, you're the one that's trafficking. You're physically driving the bus, trafficking people to the Caribbean, trafficking children to the Caribbean. How do you fucking sleep at night, probably Mm -hmm. on a pile of money that you've been given by Epstein, but you're... Flying a plane just filled with 14 and 15 year old girls to an island where you know damn well what's about to happen. Or it's happening behind you yeah. on the plane. Yeah. Uh-huh. And you are like so many of the women that we've seen with Nexium and this, they're attractive and they recruit other, you know, that kind of disarms people. It mm-hmm. Young girls see this attractive woman. That, you know, wants to befriend them and that's there's something appealing about that. And 
they you, he knew what he was doing by hiring someone like that to do that. Oh, yeah. I mean, it lulls you into a sense of security. Mm-hmm. Oh, Giselle or what's G- G- Lane? G Lane. Who knows? Who cares? Gillane. Yeah. Gillane <laughs> Maxwell. It's one of those people that I'm like, you don't deserve space in my brain. Fuck you. Yeah. But you have a female co-conspirator, Glenn Maxwell. You have a female pilot. It would. It might. I mean, and that's what some of the survivors said. Oh, well. Ghislaine was there. Like, other people were there. Mm -hmm. So I felt okay about it, not knowing that everybody's in on it. That's horrifying. It is. Well, this next one is from Leanne. Not our Leanne. Spelled differently. But the subject line is what I uh, aspire to be one day. Psychic grandma story. Hello, ladies. Love you. Love what you do. I just know you gals would love all the quirky stories about my psychic or maybe witchy grandma, Dolores. In the interest of keeping things pithy, I'll just drop you the best one. We were raised to accept that there is more than we see in our lives. The people are energy and physical form, and while those energies change and shift, they never disappear completely. Therefore, if we pay attention, we see how time, space, and all living things are all connected and tethered for eternity. So with that, it wasn't a stretch to imagine that some may be more connected than others. My mom, Alice, always told us Gma knew things, and she was highly intuitive. When we were old enough to hear them, we got story after story about the ways she exhibited this gift. One in particular happened when my mom was 15. She was working at a small diner in town for an old creep. One night as she was doing the final dishes, she was alone with him in the closed building. In true, disgusting creep fashion, he used the opportunity to corner my mom along a wall and try to kiss her. She recalled he pressed his mouth against hers, hard. She clenched her mouth shut and felt his teeth against her turned-in lips. She was able to jerk away and ran out the front door where her dad was waiting in the car to pick her up. Feeling embarrassed, ashamed, and disgusted, she didn't tell her dad what had just happened. They rode home in silence. When they got home, she went straight upstairs and got ready for bed. After a bit, her mom came upstairs, sat on the edge of her bed, and said, I'm sorry that happened to you. You don't have to go back there. Men like him always get what's coming to them somehow, and left the room. My mom recalled she felt so stunned by the conversation, she just laid there silently. Weeks later, the diner creep was in a car accident and died. It was rumored he hit the steering wheel and choked to death on his dentures. Coincidence? Did Jima know this was coming? Did Jima use her talent to help this happen? We'll never know. Thank you for hours of entertainment. As a loyal patron, can I request a few Pacific Northwest tour dates? Montana specifically, but I'll travel. And please shout out to my amazing daughter Lydia, who said she would literally pee her pants if you mentioned her. Well, sorry you have to change your pants now, Lydia. What's up? <laughs> Hello. Hi, Lydia. So many things about this. First of all, I would love to go to Montana. I yes. instead went to Chicago, but I was looking at Montana as a possible like little getaway. But I want to spend so much more time there. I've heard it's gorgeous, yes. Oh, it looks amazing. Uh, gra- this First of all, this is you as mom <laughs> slash grandma. <laughs> You're going to be like, I just know. And then just something happens. Moms I don't know. know. We- Moms know. Even in intuition, witchy stuff or not, moms know when something's gone wrong you know true i wonder though if she does if grandma has this spiritual connection like she said more than you can see energy and physical form knowing that this guy or intuiting like sensing that this guy was not only just attacking her daughter or but possibly likely others Mm mm-hmm and then knowing the way that energy flows and shifts, like he's due for an energy reshift, you know, a karmic, some type of when she says, you know, something's going to happen to him. He'll get his. He'll get his. Just seeing if she has some sort of intuition and it sees his energy of, oh, he's built up quite a lot of. He's necessi- due. He's due for a reckoning. Well, and choking on his dentures. After she recalled specifically feeling the dentures, which gross on so many levels. So disgusting. Coincidence? I don't know. Like uh, she said, we'll never know. But I very much appreciate that the mom was like, you don't have to go back there. And 
that the daughter didn't even have to come say something to her. She went to her and let her know, I know what's going on. And even if, take witchy stuff out, I think that's really important to say to kids as parents. If you can sense that something's going on with them and maybe you don't know exactly what it is, you don't have psychic powers, but just going to them and saying, if you ever need to talk to me about anything, I'm here. Nothing, Mm -hmm. like I tell Ella all the time, there's nothing you could say or do that would ever make us not love you. You know, I always want you to know you can come talk to us about anything. So they, when something like this does happen, and there's no shame in not saying something, you do feel embarrassed and ashamed. And unfortunately, that's how so many victims do feel. But if the child knows, like, I can tell them anything and I'm not going to be judged, Mm -hmm. then I think that opens up communication a lot. And it's just comforting for the kid to know. Absolutely. And knowing your parent always has your back. And yeah. I know I'm sure Ella and Simon know that, that you, you know, it's not like you're going to automatically take the any parent. Well, some parents do, but a a good parent taking their kid's side. My mom always did that. She would always take our side and say, like, if we were being shitty, you know, OK, well, let me explain what you did and why it was wrong. And then we're going to. But if my sister was in dance lessons, I believe, at a very small age and the lady in the purple pants was very mean to her and borderline abusive like yelling at little bitty kids and my sister didn't want to go back and my mom's like i'm not gonna pay money for you to be screamed at by a person if you don't you know we're not not enjoying it then yeah if it's one thing if it's like they're really nice and supportive but man it's really difficult and i don't like hard things it's like well we need to do hard things together but if it's like this person is openly mistreating Mm -hmm. me fuck that no so it's good to have a parent that has you know has their back so it sounds like the lesson we all learned was don't fuck with Dolores. No. <laughs> you get yours. <laughs> well, the next one we have is from Holly, and the subject line is a grave full of armadillos. Hey, spooksters, the nine-banded armadillo is a menace to Mississippi gardens. They destroy vegetable and flower beds in search of insects, and no one hated them more than my great aunt Mutt. You may have guessed her name wasn't really Mutt. It was Maisel, but I come from a big southern family where every aunt has a wacky name for some unknown reason. There was Tootsie, Bootsy, Dodie, Bebo, Louvie D, and of course, our story's hero, Aunt Mutt. As a person raised during the Great Depression, gardens were extremely important to Mutt. In her retirement, she treasured her time outdoors, and her beautiful garden was the envy of Vicksburg, Mississippi. But throughout those years, she stayed locked in battle with the armadillos who dug up her glorious plants at every opportunity. They were sworn enemies, and she griped about the animals to anyone who would listen. Despite her best efforts, the relentless diggers thwarted and enraged her. Everyone who knew Aunt Mutt knew of her deep, deep hatred for the nine-banded armadillo. Aunt Mutt lived a long, splendid life. We said goodbye to her in 2015 at the age of 91. And maybe it was retribution, destiny, or something else. But when we carried Aunt Mutt's coffin to the burial site, we suddenly had to delay the ceremony for two hours because her grave that had been prepared the night before at the Green Lawns Garden Cemetery was absolutely overflowing with armadillos. Damn, they got her in the end. No, fuck that. (laughs) Aunt Mutt got it. She 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 got hers. She got hers somehow you know what, from though? the other she side. She asked him. She got to kick him out one last That's time. That's true. They had to kick him out of the grave one last yeah. time. Yeah. She's like, this whole ain't for y'all. We'll delay this shit for two hours. Everybody stay where you are. <laughs> well, <laughs> Everybody watch. We're going to scoop them. Do you know how many armadillos? That gives me the heebie-jeebies to think of a grave overflowing with armadillos. Just crawling all over each That's other. That's a lot of armadillos. Too many. I also want to go down in history as everyone that knows me knows something so niche that, like, I hate the, the nine-banded <laughs> armadillo. Like, if you mention my name, they're like, oh, yeah, you mean Christy, the one that hates the armadillos? <laughs> like yeah, don't mention don't mention armadillos. Don't talk about the armadillos. You'll get an earful. <laughs> but – if it's an awkward silence and you need something to connect on, be like, fuck armadillos, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> then you immediately have a bonding tool. Exactly. I have seen an armadillo in action at an apartment complex I used to live at years ago. And I was walking my dog at the time and I saw this thing just rooting around in the grass and I came up on it. It was an armadillo. I had never seen one not dead. I mean, because in Texas, 
you see them on the side of the road dead all the time. But this was the first time I'd seen one live in action. And they're so blind that it didn't even notice we were around. And they come out at night to eat like bugs and stuff out of the dirt. It was much smaller than I thought, too. Yeah, they're interesting looking creatures. I'm trying to think. I feel like I've seen one walking in a the grassy area out at um where White was Rock? I? No, not at White Rock. Where was I? I don't know. But from far off and you go like that's so exciting it's an armadillo. But like you said, they usually can't see you, but if they do and you scare them, they will jump 3 to 4 feet in the air. Really? Yes, they that's why majority of them die on the high like roads and highways cuz they turn and look at the car. They jump, which is good. It protects them from predators in the wild, but that's exactly like three to four feet it's about <gasps> the car grill size. So the like car height. isn't really hitting it with its tire. They're jumping into the grill? Correct, yes. Holy it doesn't shit. get crunched with the tire more. I mean, it could, but it's more likely that it jumps up into the grill of the car. Well, normally, yeah, because when you see them, they're intact, just on their back on the side mm-hmm. of the road. So they haven't been run over. And depending on the Damn. height of the car, they're short little things. You could probably run over them. You know, if they didn't jump, they yeah. maybe would be able to make it. But very sad. Little non-banded armadillos. But it sounds like in Aunt Mud's case, she was like, run all Kill them, them all. over because they wrecked her life. <laughs> She's like, and tr- instead tried of to putting my death. coffin in this grave, I want you to get a water hose and just fill the whole fucking thing and drown them all. <laughs> Aunt Mutt was not This is a grave for y'all play. now, bitches. Uh, I for, I mean, I take for granted that we're from the South and we talk about country shit on here because last week everybody was talking about can burning and it's just like, oh, the they saw a UFO because they were out b- mm-hmm. drinking and burning the cans and a couple people either DM'd yeah, or tweeted. Yeah, we got some like, emails like, what? what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody on so Patreon I- goes, I'm sorry, but what is can burning? And I go, it's exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> you build a big bonfire and then you throw your empty cans in it to get rid of them. <laughs> well, I te- texted my country ass friend because I said, you ever? I said, you ever been out drinking in a field and then burn the cans? He said, many times. <laughs> is this Ian? Oh yeah. <laughs> and then I let him know, and then I said, it's redneck shit. <laughs> he said, it's like snipe hunting, cow tipping, oh, and couch burning. <laughs> yep, snipe hunting. Man, that was I got a, a friend of mine in high school. Oh, y'all, y'all did it to him? Uh, I was not there, but it there was... Did y'all have Young Life? Which, oh, yeah. In yeah, yeah, hindsight, yeah. I think I've talked about this before, this how leaders of Young Life would come to our high school and just, like, talk to us at lunch and stuff. And he was a much older man. Good looking. Yeah. Much older than we were at the time. He was probably in his mid-20s. Mm-hmm. We were high school kids. And, you know, looking back, that's weird and probably problematic, and he shouldn't have been allowed on campus, but it was the 90s. It was. You'd be like, they're just fr- they're friends with the children. Yeah. It's like they're unrelated well, Also, adults. anybody could just walk in. You, there was no, like, any, <laughs> there was no uh, metal detectors, any kind Security. of locked doors. Yeah, you just walked in. Um, but there was some, like, Young Life event where... Yeah, I think it was a camping thing, and there was snipe hunting, and one of the girls got got taken for a ride because if caught. you don't know what snipe hunting is, snipes aren't real, but everybody pretends that they are real, and then you go snipe hunting, and everyone that's in on it, it's like, oh, I see one, and you just hit the ground with a stick, and you act like you're killing snipes, and then people will start to think that like oh they're seeing snipes but really there's nothing it's just it's all um, just to trick somebody just a redneck forest game <laughs> i guess <laughs> it's all redneck prank well yeah can- so for those of you listening can burn it i wouldn't recommend it i believe when you burn a can it releases chemicals into Probably the air that not good for yeah, the environment no i like to recycle yeah my cans. just recycle <laughs> just recycle them just put them in a bucket and tommy recycle. yesterday Tried to throw a plastic container, like takeout container in the trash. I go, babe, that's plastic. And he said, all right, well, since you're still pretending that we recycle, I guess I'll put it in the recycling. I go, what are you talking about? We recycle. He goes, I mean the city of Dallas. Since you're still pretending the city of Dallas recycles. And I was like, what? Do we not recycle? Is it a scam? I think some of recycling is a scam. Well, I told you at Navy Pier, now they have 
I don't know. But when I worked there, there would be a trash can in a recycling bin. And I saw the person come get the trash bag, take the recycling bin, put it in the trash yeah. bag, tie it up, and then walk off. My the brother thought, saw the same thing in high school out the window of his classroom. The, uh, what is it called? The like tr- a dump truck? What is it? Like a dump truck? Yeah, but isn't it called something? The trash, trash truck? Trash <laughs> truck? Dump truck? <laughs> I feel like it's called something, but I can't think of it now. Anyways, he saw them pull up and empty both the big dumpsters of recycling and trash right into the same thing. So Damn. And I will say the city of Dallas only recycles very small things. Like, you know, if you look at the bottom and they have numbers, we only recycle like two of the numbers out of I don't know, 10, 15 numbers. Get it together. So a lot of stuff is not recyclable here, but, you know. Well, I feel emotionally better putting it in a blue bag, so I'm going to keep doing that. Yeah. And I'm not huffing can fumes, mm-hmm. so I'm not going to burn it either. Well, this next story is from Jessica, and the subject line is tiny alien invasion in my bedroom. All right. This is a weird one, but everyone I've told this to has little to no explanation. When I was in high school and living with my parents, there was one night, just like any other, I did my nightly routine and went to lie down in bed to sleep. Now at this time, my bed was on the floor on a box mattress instead of a bed frame because I like being close to the ground. This is important. I turned off the lights and the only thing lit in my room was a nightlight by the door. I closed my eyes and as soon as I did, I saw the room outline while my eyes were still closed. I saw seven to ten tiny figures made of this white light walking across the floor and peek over my mattress. Think the Kodama from Princess Monoke, but with no faces and more spindly. Now at this time, I did not partake in any drugs and have no prior history of hallucinations. I opened my eyes and everything looked normal. Closed them again and they were still there walking around, looking at the furniture and looking at me. One was right next to my face just staring with a blank face. It was not a scary experience, just so strange because I couldn't figure out what was going on. When I opened my eyes, they were gone. I closed my eyes again, and there were just a few left, as if they saw what they needed to see and made their way out. I closed my eyes again, and they were all gone, and shortly after, I fell asleep. When I told my mom about it, she asked if I was doing drugs. No. If I had anything weird to eat or drink, I said no. She blamed it on pre-sleep dreams or that I was falling asleep and my mind was playing tricks on me. Maybe, but I've never seen them again. About a year later, I was dating this guy and we were talking about alien encounters when I told him about my little light guys. His face dropped and he started to describe something he saw when he was in middle school, exactly the same shape and height and light illuminating them and everything. He said he was sharing a room with his brother and they both saw them. So. Is this a tiny alien phenomenon or just two strange dreams? Love you guys and the podcast. Thanks for keeping it creepy. Jess. I am offended that I have not encountered these guys because they sound fun and cute. They sound adorable. I, I really want to see them. Uh, the Kodama from Princess Mononoke. They are. They look like almost like tiny Fresno nightcrawlers, but they have, mm-hmm. but they're white they outlines. Glow. And they have like little eyes, yeah. like uh, two eyes and a mouth. But this, these had no faces and were more spindly. Yeah, you're right. I wish I had these. It, if your mom saying pre sleep dreams, the hypnagogic state or hypno, mm-hmm. I can never say it right, is that's what Salvador Dali loved to. He would put something in his hand, so if it dropped, it would wake him up because he would get these like wild visions mm-hmm. and wanted to immediately sketch them and write them down right when he woke up. So it was the mental state right before falling asleep mm-hmm. he found the most amazing wild looking almost lucid dreaming a bit mm-hmm. yeah yeah i will say it's quite interesting that you met someone else that saw it and i don't know if you guys are still together but it'd be real great if you were because if that something that bizarre happened to me and then i met someone that it also happened to them i feel like maybe those little light guys are trying to do a little meet cute Oh, they're matchmakers. They're matchmaking. That, the Lifetime, the Christmas holiday Valentine's movie we didn't know we needed. Oh, gosh. Little light friends. Yes. Please write in 
Jessica, and let us know if you ended up staying with that guy. Because <laughs> if it ended up working, out, I would like to know just personally. <laughs> yeah, also that, just out of curiosity, but mm-hmm. hopefully, yeah, tiny light aliens brought them together, and love kept them that way. Wow. Writes itself. Well, thank you so much, Jess. Uh, probably it was aliens. That's my vote anyway. Always aliens. Uh, the next one we have is from Bella, and the subject line is drive through danger. Hey, guys. I'm in love with this new segment and obsessed with y'all's humor. Truly great humans you guys sound to be. Enough with the fangirling. Let's get into it. For some background info, I'm freshly 18 and have always had two or more jobs because of personal issues. This happened about a week before my birthday, June 18th. Anyway, I'm a server at this restaurant, decently popular, so I won't disclose the name, which also includes a drive through I serve from 4 to 8 and then work the drive through from 8 to 12. So the beginning of my drive through shift, a woman drives straight through the speaker into the window, which, like, what the fuck, but whatever. When she gets there, I lean out the window and ask, how may I help her? It's only 8.30 p.m., so still pretty light outside but she is absolutely wasted. She asks for directions to a local dispensary shop, and I hesitantly give her directions. She drives off without ordering anything, and I think that's the end of it. Boy, was I wrong. Around 11.40 p.m., we're all exhausted. It was a Saturday night, so we'd just finished a really big rush, and we're all starting to close work. Suddenly, the headset dings, alerting me and my manager, we'll call him Dan, and the other drive through person, Bill, that someone has pulled up. Annoyed, my manager does the very scripted intro and asks the person to order. Immediately, we're met with screams. Not angry customer yells. I'm talking bloody murder. We all freeze and look to the TV above us, which uses a security camera to make a straight shot to the speaker. Literally, nothing is happening. She's just screaming into the speaker. My manager attempts to calm her down, and she starts screaming that she wants to talk to the girl she talked to earlier. I'm the only female presenting employee working that night, so I turn my mic on and try to talk to her. Almost instantly, she stops screaming, and in the sweetest voice, she orders. We're all weirded out, but start getting her drinks and food ready. However, she just stays at the speaker. For like five minutes, she just sits there. We tell her multiple times she can pull forward, but she doesn't. Finally, she pulls forward, and I greet her. This is when I realize it's the same woman I gave directions to earlier. When I say this lady was on a different freaking planet, I tell her the total, but she starts to order more things, which, like, okay, it's whatever, but it was like getting an order from a tired toddler. Literally in the middle of taking her second order, she falls asleep. She does this, like, five other times, and it's genuinely freaking me out. I take her money and shut and lock the window. I call Dan on the headset and tell him to get his ass over here. I tell him I'm too scared to take her order and maybe we should call the police because she's a threat. He agrees and takes over. However, the second he opens the window, she begins screaming and literally hissing. She's freaking foaming at the mouth and demanding I continue checking her out. The coward turns to me like, you heard the woman. I so do not get paid enough for this. I hand her her change and she straight up passes out and drops it all on the ground. Dan leans into the window with me and calls out to her to wake her up. She does, and when she sees him, she starts hissing again. I'm so terrified at this point. I give her her food and think this insanity is finally over. But when I close the window, she grabs it. I'm embarrassingly sensitive and start crying because of the stress and fear. She tells me she wants to tip me and reaches over to the passenger seat. She turns back around, hands me 60 bucks, a baggie of pills, and a freaking switchblade. My whole body is shuddering at this point, so Bill grabs me and locks the window. Dan calls the cops, and we sit in the dish pit. Our main grill guy, we'll call him Joe, stands by the window until she drives away. He takes a picture of her license plate when she leaves, agonizingly slow, apparently, and the cops show up not even five minutes later. At this point, I'm having a full-blown panic attack, something else I struggle with, while they ask us questions. One of the cops stays to talk to us, and the other two drive off in their cars to go find the woman. They take the tip after they return empty-handed. Apparently, they ran the plate, and it was fake? They never found her, and I got the next three days off. I recently put in my two weeks' notice for unrelated reasons, but I still have to have someone walk me to my car after every shift because Joe and Bill insisted. 
Working in fast food, I have a ton more horror stories, but none like this, so I thought I'd share. Thank you all for all the hard work you put into this podcast. It's like two portable best friends to laugh with at any time. Keep it creepy. Love, B. Bella. People that work drive throughs are angels. I don't... Yeah. It's... Hero. Heroes. Your heroes. I've just heard... But, you know, you're like standing in line inside and you hear transactions going on. You're like, who do you think you are to speak to somebody like that? You monster. Yeah. This is next level. Clearly, she was on a ton of drugs and mm -hmm. should not have been behind the wheel. No. But when you're just it's it's late at night and somebody is hissing and foaming at the mouth like a rabid dog. And there's videos online you see of even though they're in their car and you're in the drive through window, the depending on the height of the car, it's not that much to right. jump through the window. Yeah, people so have. It's definitely. That oh, woman yeah. that lost her mind over some chicken nuggets. Remember that video they were in viral? Oh, yeah. Climbed Stuff through like the fucking thing, like tried to attack them. Yeah. It's, it's a safety a, issue. I mean, I think you're yeah. the bot. Well, the one boss being like, you heard the woman. Go talk to her. She's hissing at me. Like, no, I'm not going to do no, that. At no. At some point, just be like, listen, we're not going to give you your order. Fucking leave. Like, close you, the window. Leave. You shut the window. You lock it. You call the cops. I think you did the right thing for sure. I would have done that probably as soon as the screaming started. That's um, That's real unhinged behavior. If someone is screaming that much at the speaker it's just like you're not getting your food tonight you need to go <laughs> it's just like, well and it's yeah, also continue. very i mean maybe they are in distress you don't know what's happening you know if they're having like a psychotic break or yeah. something they're also a danger to others because the they're completely wasted behind the wheel possibly a danger to themselves you were right to put on your two reeks and and also don't feel bad that you get like that in stressful situations, cry and stuff. I'm the same way. It's you're overwhelmed. It's sensory overload. And it's just like your, your brain's way of kind of like protecting you from something. So don't feel like, um, maybe I read, read it wrong. They said, I, I get embarrassingly, yeah, embarrassingly yeah, sensitive. Yeah. And be sensitive. Don't be embarrassed Fine. about that. It's, I think it's very normal and, uh, a, a response that makes sense, especially in this situation. I just saw an uh, old interview with Macho Man Randy Savage on Arsenio Hall, and Arsenio Hall said, you're a macho man. Do you ever cry? And he said, yes, macho friends of all men, macho men, macho whoever, you should all cry. You should feel every range of emotions. Aww. I've cried a thousand times before, and I'll cry a thousand times again. Of course, he's like, oh, macho man, I've cried a thousand times before and a thousand <laughs> times again. So Macho Man Randy Savage cried if he needed to cry. You're, this is a perfect situation to cry in. Mm -hmm. I'm also a stress crier. If someone is confronting me or if I'm – that's why there's a meme going around that was like, lawyers, how do you argue with people without crying? I'm like, great question. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> Mine so, would be how do you argue back. without um, getting so heated that the judge is like, uh, ma'am, we need you to sit down. <laughs> Like Mrs. Wallace, we can't actually bolt down the tables any harder than we have. Could you fl stop flipping them? <laughs> the, the county is running out of screws. Yeah, but I do get I cry when I feel like I'm um, getting in trouble. Oh yeah, like if there's this I one specific incident I can remember is when the place that I worked at before I started living my dreams with you. Uh, fired me when I was four months pregnant for some bullshit I did not even do. And I, well, not only was I pregnant, but I was also like getting in trouble and getting fired. And I was like hysterical about oh, yeah. it. So yeah. I cry very much in those situations and did in grade school and middle school too. If I thought I was getting in trouble by a teacher, I would cry. I cannot. Yeah, I can't take uh, part of having ADHD also is reje rejection sensitive dysphoria where you like can't take like people pleasing to the max and you can't accept like disappointing people and you have to be everyone's favorite and have to. So I struggle with that, too. And that involves even a the uh, possibility that someone is upset with me. I will. I now have to have coping mechanisms to deal mm -hmm. with it, but would previously fully melt down and be like, oh my God, they're mad at me. They're going to freak out. They're, and yeah, I mean, now we've been friends so long, but early on I'd be like, oh my God, I did this. Oh my God, are you so mad? You're like, no. 
people are like, why are you freaking out? And I'm like, oh, my, the amount of times Paris has to say no when I'm like, are you mad at me? He'll just be like, for what? <laughs> He's like, you're sitting there. You didn't do anything. Well, it sounds so like just, anxiety. It's all consuming well, and we're <laughs> just, uh, I mean, I'm the same anxiety way. anxiety about with a other very stuff. specific thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I'm the but same way, but with other, other things. Difficult. So don't feel bad. B, you uh, you did the right thing. Good job putting in your two weeks. We hope you find a new job where no one hisses, no one screams, and it's uh, a lovely, pleasant experience. What a you tip. Deserve it. 60 bucks, a baggie of pills, and a switchblade. That's it. That's the <laughs> tip right there. Wow. 20%? That's so 2021. 2022 <laughs> is $60, <laughs> bag of pills, and a switchblade. You're welcome. Here you go, kid. You need this. Good I like, luck. It wasn't 50 it was sixty. Sixty dollars. <laughs> such a specific amount of money to three, have in your card cash. And I know it's three sweaty twenties. We all do, <laughs> crumpled up. And uh, man, a switchblade. Those they don't make. They don't make oh, them like that. Oh man. She was like, "What do I have a value in this car that I can just grab?" And those yeah. were within her reach yeah. in a car that she was driving. She's ready. She, yeah. You gotta be. You don't keep your switch blade under the seat. You gotta no. keep it right in the center console. Well, hopefully that woman also was found and given help because, like you said, mm-hmm. that is a danger to others being driving around. And uh, hopefully they, uh, I'm sure, driving erratically, behaving that way. Hopefully she was pulled over before she hurt anybody. Yeah. Well, thank you, B. Thank you, B. And thank you to everyone else for sending in your Freaky Friday stories. If you have an odd but true story, maybe you've encountered Bigfoot, you've seen a UFO, you had a brush with true crime, or you felt the presence of an otherworldly being, send them in at SinisterHood.com slash Freaky Friday. We love providing Sinisterhood to you at no cost. So if you like what you hear, consider supporting the show by donating to our Patreon. We're a small operation, creating the show for you by researching, writing, recording, and producing it ourselves. Any amount is sincerely appreciated and helps offset the cost of making and hosting the show. As a thank you, you'll also get some sweet perks like ad-free episodes, a Sinisterhood sticker, Membership to our exclusive Patreon Facebook group for those in the Rolling the Airwaves and Getting Into It tier, a special shout-out on the show, a monthly bonus mini-sode, and patron-exclusive video and audio content, including Am I the Asshole, Relationship Advice, Judge Christie, Dear Sinister, True Crime Headlines, and so much more. You also have the fun perk of access to our Discord server, where you can connect with other fans in real time and discuss the latest in true crime, share personal ghost stories, or just post adorable pictures of your pets. We hop on occasionally, and we host monthly Q&As on Crowdcast, where you can ask us all your burning questions. For patrons not in the U.S., you have the option to pay in pounds or euros, saving you the cost of our conversion fee. Saving you the cost of the conversion fee. Annual memberships for all tiers are also now available. Those that select this option will be rewarded with a free month of membership. For more details on all of this and specific member tiers, visit SinisterHood.com and click Patreon on the top banner. So many of you have been tagging us in pictures of you sporting your sweet Sinisterhood merch. Keep those pictures coming. Open the package. Turns out Paris got the one with the triangle on it. It's very cool. The, the Sinister Hood logo. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. With the spooky triangle eye. With Jude, the eyeball. Jude designed those. Oh, yeah, Jude. You got to get you some cool Sinister Hood swag, some of which was designed by the amazing artist Day Off, including T-shirts, mugs, totes, and even clothes for your kiddos. Visit SinisterHood.com and click shop on the top banner. The best thing you can do to help us grow is like, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast. And please tell a friend who you think would like us to check us out. It means so much to us and really helps podcasts like us get more exposure. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Sinisterhood Pod. Like us on Facebook at Sinisterhood. We also have TikTok, YouTube, and if you go to Sinisterhood.com slash playlist, you can share our Freaky Friday playlist with someone that you love that needs a boost on this wonderful Friday. Christy, where are you on the computer? I'm on Instagram at Christy M. Wallace and on Twitter and TikTok where I post nothing, but you're welcome to follow because one day I'll post something (laughs) at Christy or GTFO. Heather? I am on Twitter. I made a tweet yesterday. Nice. About Sandman. About the Sandman? About the Sandman show. Is that that show everybody's talking about? On Netflix. Sandman show. Is it good? Oh, yeah. Okay. I got to get in on it. I've watched the first four episodes, oh, and wow. I was trying to make Paris stay up all night to watch all of them, so no one would spoil it, but it's 10, and he's like, I have to wake up in the <laughs> it's morning. It's like, that's six more hours of TV. <laughs> I was like, 
whatever. <laughs> Some of us, me, didn't go to bed until four o'clock in the morning. And I'll tell you offline why, because I fell into a TikTok conspiracy. Anyway, <laughs> I'm searching up TikTok conspiracies at Heather versus the world on TikTok and Instagram and uh, tweeting those hot tweets at MCK versus the world on Twitter. As always, the devil rules the airwaves. Keep it creepy.